we'll need to do a report out from the closed session. Um, Kate, if you'd like to say a few words about that. Um, and then we can do a roll call. Yeah, well, we really have nothing to report out from closed sessions since we took no action. So that's uh, correct. We, yep. So we were in closed session, and now we're in, in open section. And Darlene, uh, you can do the roll call. Thank you. City of Belvedere. City of Benicia. Elizabeth Patterson here. City of Concord. County of Contra Costa. I'm here. Town of, thanks, John. Town of Quarter Madeira. Sloan Bailey here. Town of Danville. Lisa Blackwell here. City of El Cerrito. Mayor Greg Lyman. Town of Fairfax. Here, Barbara Kohler. City of Lafayette. Mike Anderson here. City of Larkspur. City of Larkspur. He was there. Thank you. County of Marin. Here. City of Martinez. Town of Moraga, County of Napa, and all five Napa cities. Folks are forgetting to unmute themselves when they. Uh, I know. Acknowledge their. Hearing. I see. I see you. I see you, Brad. <laughs> City of Novato. Here, Denise Athos. Thank you. City of Oakley. Sue Higgins here. City of Pano. Vincent Sadimi here. City of Pittsburgh. Chanel Skills Preston here. City of Richmond. Town of Ross. Town of San Anselmo. City of San Pablo, City of San Rafael, City of San Ramon, Scott Perkins here, City of Sausalito, and the City of Mill Valley, Ray Withy here, County of Solano, Town of Tiburon, City of Walnut Creek, Justin Waddell here. Thank you. Darlene, this is Bob McCaskill. Can you hear me now? Yes, very Thanks. well. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Also, I believe there are a few folks that um, I was able to see, but we couldn't hear. And so maybe for the recording, we'll confirm that we have them with us. Um, Director Haroff, are you with us? Director Haroff, can you try unmuting yourself? Um, I'm not on mute. Have. Now we can hear yes. you. Yes. Okay, good. I'm on, Kevin. I'm on a phone line, so I'm, and so that's that may be a, a challenge. Sorry, sorry about that. Okay, um, and Director Wagon Connect, are you with us? <laughs> okay, yeah, we can see you talking. So, I think you you also are on mute. If you can try unmuting mm -hmm. yourself. Okay. There we go. Now we. Yeah. Can, yes. Now we can hear you. Okay. Thank you. Great. And Director Butt, are you with us from Richmond? Okay. And um, Director Green from San Anselmo, are you with us? I think you may be on mute, Director Green. How about now? Uh, now we can hear you. Okay, great. great. I'd done it the wrong way. Okay. Then I think we have a quorum and we're ready to get started, Director Sears. We're good. We Thank do. you so much. And obviously this is our first Zoom meeting and I think by the time we get to the end of the coronavirus, 
excitement we're going to be pr pros at doing this. So um, any board announcements before we move on with the agenda? Okay. And remind everybody that just joined that we should not be using the uh, chat function. Thank you for that. It's helpful. All right. Um, it's now public open time for items not on our agenda, and I want to welcome any members of the public who may be with us. I don't know if folks have phoned in or how you may be here with us, so um, bear with us as we try to acknowledge you. Anyone from the public who would like to speak in open time? All right, I'm not seeing any indication of any public. Um, so let's move on to item four on our agenda, which is the report from the Chief Executive Officer, Dawn. Great, I've got a few items um, this evening and um, just want to confirm that in the closed session, the board received a status update and um, discussed MCE's position, but no decisions were made. Um, and uh, I just wanted to, um, uh, give folks a quick update on MCE's response to um, COVID-19. First of all, um, we have shifted to remote work for all staff. This took effect on Monday. And uh, so far it's going very smoothly. The workflow has transitioned well. Um, we're using a combination of um, VPN and um, MCE issued laptops. And uh, fortunately because we've had two offices uh, for a while, we've had a lot of experience with remote work and uh, video meetings. So things have gone relatively smoothly. Um, as far as our operations, we have suspended non-paying customer transfers to PG&E. And um, this, we've also suspended all collections activity until further notice. Um, as we know, some of our customers will be having some financial hardship um, related to um, COVID-19. Um, and then last of all, I wanted to let folks know that all community meetings have been transitioned to remote access. And last night, um, we held our first remote access uh, Solano uh, enrollment meeting, and um, it went really well. Our public affairs team did a great job. We had um, participation from members of the public, and um, it went very smoothly. Um, next, I wanted to pass along some really good news that MCE was awarded a grant from the Marine Community Foundation. Um, of $750,000. This is um, to retrofit nonprofit critical facilities with resiliency measures and support affordable housing, um, in, especially focused in Marin County. So this will really supplement our um, resiliency fund um, that uh, your board may recall we set up la late last year to help with the PSPS events. Um, and this will be really focused on our, uh, in our low income sector for nonprofit critical facilities. Um, next, I wanted to pass along the exciting news that MCE is a recipient of the 2020 Actera Business Environmental Awards um, in the Environmental Project category for our work on MCE Solar One. Um, we are co-awarded with the City of Richmond and Richmond Build for our leadership on this project. Um, and it's um, for those of you that don't know, this is a really great organization, and um, it's a it's a great honor to um, get this award. So. It'll be um, delivered to us um, at an event in May, if that can still happen, or possibly later in the year. Um, next, I wanted to let folks know that MCE was invited to um, um, move to the next stage of potential funding by the CEC for our, California, our um, EV infrastructure project, Cal EVIP. Um, this was discussed at our uh, board meeting at the end of last year, and the board gave MCE staff the green light to submit an application um, for this funding award. We have not received the award yet, but we have been moved to the next stage, which is uh, a very good sign. Um, if we do receive the award, um, we will be notified in June, and we would be attracting $15.5 million in state funding into our service area for EV charging projects across our four-county region. Um, so we're really excited about that, and we'll keep you all posted on next steps. Um, next, I wanted to let folks know that MCE has established a technology and analytics department. Um, we did that early in the year. It turned out to be really good timing <laughs> to get that in place. Um, this department was really set up to perform data, analy data analytics, um, a new customer relations management system, or CRM, 
uh, platform and to shift in-house massive amounts of data that have been managed by an external vendor until now. Um, we'll be talking about this a little bit more in the budget item later on, um, but I just wanted to let folks know about this new department because it's going to be allowing MCE to control, mine, and leverage data for operational needs. So really excited about um, this uh, new um, this new team that we're going to have to um, increase our um, our ability to design programs and implement programs going forward. Um, next on the transaction side, I wanted to let folks know that we completed an RFO, Request for Offer, for our Resiliency and Storage Program uh, late last, at the very end of last year. We received 18 bids uh, on this RFO. We've identified um, the top bidder, and we are in negotiation now to get a contract in place that will be coming to XCOM um, the first week of April. Um, and this is going to help us with our battery storage um, deployment for solar plus storage islanding at critical facilities and also for, for vulnerable customers. Um, also, you'll, you'll see on the consent calendar we have a battery giveaway program that's going to be targeted at medical baseline care customers. And um, you'll be hearing more about this um, in April. Uh, we will be doing a um, a portable battery giveaway for these customers based on the resiliency funds that were approved last year. Um, next, I wanted to let folks know that our uh, 2020 open season request for offers wrapped up a couple of weeks ago. Um, bids were all due on March 2nd. We received 85 offers from 32 unique counterparties, um, so a very robust response. The shortlisted bids will be presented to the Ad Hoc Contracts Committee in the next month or so. We are just um, going through the shortlisting process now. So we're excited about that. Um, and then I wanted to pass along some good news that um, despite the implementation of AB 1110 regulations, which are um, related to greenhouse gas accounting, we have made some adjustments in our procurement, and MCE is going to be able to maintain a 90% carbon-free uh, content in 2020, um, despite these regulations. Um, we were thinking that that wasn't going to be possible, but um, it, it is going to be possible, so I just wanted to pass along that good news. Um, and only two more items to go. Sorry for the lengthy report this evening. Um, MCE has been... Um, uh, very heavily engaged with the PG&E RFO process for the upcoming PSPS events this year. And some of you may have um, heard about the uh, proposal to install uh, fossil-based generation at substations in our service area, particularly in Napa and Marin. Um, MCE and other local government agencies expressed concern about the local air emissions and encourage PG&E to only consider these installations on a temporary basis. Um, they were initially proposing to install these for a 10-year period. Um, we were concerned about the air emissions and the cost related to those installations. We just learned yesterday that PG&E has agreed to not go forward with the 10-year installations of um, fossil generators at these substations. Instead, they are uh, now looking to just do temporary installations that would probably be portable in nature. So that's a very good outcome. Um, and the last item is I just wanted to let folks know that MCE participated in the Cal CCA Lobby Day. Uh, Cal CCA, for those of you that might not remember, is the statewide trade association of CCAs across the state. Lobby Day was last week, just before things shut down, so we were able to do a lot of um, meet and greets with um, our delegation um, and um, delegates across the state. Um, I want to thank our board members for participating in um, many of the in-district meetings um, so that we were able to build those relationships. And that is it for my report, unless anyone has questions. Super, Don. Thank you. Lots of good news. Any questions for Don or comments? I have a question. I raised my hand. Good job. Um, <laughs> we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, um, Don. Congratulations on the MCF uh, grant. That'll be great. Um, uh, Kate Sears knows uh, that there is an apartment building in Fairfax that the San Geronimo Affordable Housing Association is going to purchase to preserve as affordable housing, and the county has awarded them a half a million 
MCF has awarded them a half a million and they are doing more traditional financing to raise the rest of the money, but they will need um, a lot of funding for upgrades, maintenance, as well as energy efficiency. So I thought of the LIFT program, but unfortunately they cannot access HUD money for the rest of the maintenance. So I guess just put that on your radar. It's 300 Olima as something, I believe MCE has worked with San Geronimo Affordable Housing Association in the past. So just a Thank quick note. Thank you, Director Kohler. I'll make sure that our um, programs team, energy efficiency folks, follow up on that. I appreciate it. Super. Thank you. Anyone else with a comment or a question on Don's report? Okay. Anyone from the public would like to make a comment on the executive director's report? All right. Hearing none, uh, we're going to move on to the next item on our agenda, which is our consent calendar. It has three items on it. The minutes from the November 21st, 2019 meeting. Two contracts. Excuse me. Okay. Update and uh, a resolution amending our conflict of interest code. Is there any item on the um, excuse me consent calendar that anyone would like to have more information about or discuss if there's no item i move to approve thank you uh, second, second board in san anselmo wait no i actually have my hand raised uh-oh <laughs> um, this is sloan from Corte madeira calling and i have a question about the approved contracts update kate would you rather that we simply move c1 and c3 and we remove c2 or can I ask a question and then we'll do it as a group? I'm fine if you ask a question and we'll do it as a group. Okay, um, it's probably for Garth or Don, but one of the items as we've discussed in the past is a $24 million um, contract per average annual contract amount, $24 million a year. That's item number 15, which is the purchase of system energy. Um, can you just remind me who looks at a 24 per year contract for one to five years um, before you approve it? Thank you for the question, Director Bailey. I'm happy to respond to that. Um, so we have a, um, a process of approval that um, we go through for contracts um, of this size internally. Um, and then we also go through um, a process of approval um, outside of the staff. So um, the staff approval process includes um, legal review, credit review, um, commercial review, technical review, um, and uh, we, we in, in addition to running it through our internal um, power resources folks and our finance team, we um, also um, loop it out to our external counsel for uh, transaction support and then also our um, typically um, Pacific Energy Advisors um, will do a review, particularly for these types of transactions. Um, they're involved in reviewing those. Um, also for these transactions, they do get mentioned at a um, committee or board meeting um, uh, beforehand. So um, um, in executive committee or technical committee, depending on um, what's relevant. Um, I will often uh, mention in the CEO report if we're in the process of um, preparing for one of these transactions. And then the final approval, um, anything that is uh, one to five years, the final approval is um, uh, by both me and the board chair. So Director Sears is involved in approving um, that size of transaction as well. So that's the approval process for something of that term. So for a, a so th thank you, Don. So for a twenty-four million dollar contract from Hedge for System Energy, item number fifteen, Pacific Energy Advisors and yourself and Kate, have you weighed in? You've seen this. You're okay with twenty-four million dollars a year for four to five years? I have. I review the contracts and I see and I and I am informed about everyone who has signed off on it, assuming they have before I co-sign along with Don. Okay. Thank you. All righty. Okay, good. I think we had a motion and a second to approve the consent calendar. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 I'm assuming we can aye. 
do this and we don't need a roll. I'm just wondering, do we do we do we need roll calls given the yeah, fact know. that we're doing these video yep. you, we're, you, we're doing doing you know, I, this is my sorry, this Actually, is my favorite we do. For today. And we did we did everything by roll call. We we have to do everything by roll call that requires action. Okay. All right. Okay. Off we go. Come on. City of Belvedere. Yes. City of Benicia. Yes. City of Concord. Contra Costa County. Yes. Town of Corte Madera. Yes. Town of Danville. Yes. City of El Cerrito. Yes. Town of Fairfax. Yes. City of Lafayette. Yes. City of Larkspur. Yes. County of Marin. Yes. City of Martinez. Town of Moraga. County of Napa and all five Napa cities. Yes, six times. Yes. <laughs> City of Novato. Here. City of Oakley. Yes. City of Pinole. Yes. City of Pittsburgh. Yes. City of Richmond. Town of Ross. Town of San Anselmo. Yes. City of San Pablo. City of San Rafael. City of San Ramon. Yes. City of Sausalito and the city of Mill Valley. Yes. Oh, County of Solano. Town of Tiburon. City of Walnut Creek. Aye. All right. Roll call complete. Great. Thank you very much, Darlene. Consent calendar is approved. Um, and I have a quick question. Sure. Could I remind everyone to say their name just for the recording? Um, how did you record the vote from Novato? Sorry, I meant yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. Are we good on the vote? I have you. I have you as yes, Denise. Thank you. Thanks, Darlene. All right. So uh, the next item on our agenda, number six, is uh, the Charles McLachlan Advocacy Awards. And we discussed potentially deferring this item. Dawn, yeah, is there something you wanted to say about that? Yeah, thank you. We are going to defer this item to um, a future board meeting. Um, we'd like to be able to um, give the awardees their awards in person. And um, so we will defer this to a future meeting. I think it's a great idea, and I understand that one of the awardees has created a song, and I know we're going to want to hear that in person. So uh, we will find an appropriate date that works for everyone in the future. Okay, now moving on to item seven, this additional board members to committees. And uh, Dawn, are you the one to introduce this one? Yes, I'm going to introduce this item. So. Um, what you have in your board packet is a list of the current uh, members of our um, standing committees and our ad hoc committees. And um, during this agenda item, we can make additions to any of the committees, um, but we're per particularly interested in making additions to the ad hoc audit committee and the ad hoc bonding committee. And um, so I'll say a little bit about these two committees while you think about where you might want to um, join. Um, the ad hoc audit committee um, is uh, typically formed around this time in the year to um, assist with the MCE audit process. Um, it typically only involves a couple of meetings um, in the spring in, in advance of the annual audit cycle that begins in May of each year. Um, and we have um, in your packet, you can see who participated in this committee last year, directors McCaskill, um, Director um, Paban Alvarado, Director Haraf, and Director Withy. Um, 
it's good. Uh, it would be fine to have a few folks carry over and a few uh, new faces if there's anyone interested. And then the other committee that we're looking to form this evening is the Ad Hoc Committee on Bonding. Um, this is a new committee that we've never had before, and it relates to an agenda item that happens later in the meeting. So it would be okay if we want to um, form this committee during that agenda item. Um, so I'll kind of leave that one um, up for discussion later. Um, but at this time, I just want to highlight folks that have expressed interest in um, uh, the committees as reflected in your board packet. So um, on the executive committee, we have Director Edie Bersan from uh, Concord that has expressed interest in uh, rejoining that committee. He, he was a part of it previously. Um, so that is um, one person we might want to add. And then in our ad hoc audit committee, Directors um, McCaskill and also um, Director Haras um, expressed an interest in being in that committee. So we have two folks um, interested in that committee so far. Um, so at this point, I'd, I'd like to hear if um, there are folks interested in joining the executive committee, uh, the technical committee, or the ad hoc audit committee. Um, and then we can talk about the bonding committee after that. Uh, this is Ray Withy. I'd be happy to uh, continue on the ad hoc uh, audit committee. This is Greg Lyman. I would be interested in the ad hoc's contract committee if there is a position open. Yes, there is. Thank you. And Don, do you need us to say we want to? Uh, this is Denise. I'm sorry. Uh, do you want us to say if we still are interested in being on a committee or? Is it just? We are not looking to remove anyone okay. from a committee yeah. right now. So if you're already on it, um, yeah. you're you're staying on it. Um, good. I'm not going to say otherwise. <laughs> I want to. That's good. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, great. Um, Sloan, did you any? want to say something? I am. I will not be on the executive committee. I am I did not run for re-election, and this is my last meeting. So good luck and God bless to everybody else. Oh, unbelievable. We're going to miss you. We are. Yeah. yeah. Totally. Okay. Where are you going to get to the electrons after this? <laughs> okay. Do we have anyone else interested in particular committees? So we still, we still need one more person for the ad hoc audit committee, Dawn. Is that right? It's not required. There's not a required number but um, we certainly have room okay. if anyone else is interested. Okay. All right. Do you want to go ahead, if, if no one's raising their hand at this moment, do we want to go ahead and approve those additions to the executive committee and the ad hoc audit committee before we move on to the next item? Yes. And, and let's also include the addition to the ad hoc contracts committee, Director Lyman. So right. I'll, All right. I'll repeat what I've got down here. So the executive committee would change because Director Bailey is stepping down. Um, Director Birsan is joining executive committee. For the ad hoc contracts committee, Director Lyman would be joining. And for the ad hoc audit committee for 2020, we would include Director McCatskill, Director Haroff, and Director Withy. All right. I would move that wagon connect from Napa. Thank you. Okay. Did you get that? Got Which that, one? Director Wagon Connect. Thank you. Napa. Okay. Which, I did. Yes. Which committee were you joining, Brett? I'm just moving the the slate. Oh, oh, thank you very much. Do I have a second? So I got a second. Thank you. And I hate to say it, but I guess we're going to have to do another roll call, which really is discouraging for decision making here tonight. But Darlene, you're getting <laughs> real quick at it. So go for it. I will. <clears throat> City of Belvedere. Yes. City of Benicia. Yes. City of Concord. Contra Costa County. Yes. Town of Quarter Madeira. Yes. Town of Danville. Yes. City of El Cerrito. 
So, don't, so I'm wondering if we can just say the city name and then we can go a little faster. This is Greg Lyman, yes. Thank you. Town of Fairfax. Garver Kohler, yes. Lafayette. Yes. City of Larkspur. Kevin, can you unmute yourself, please? Uh, yeah, I thought I was. So, no, do, can, can you hear me now? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yes. The Thank answer you. is yes. Thank, Thank you. County of Marin. Yes. City of Martinez. Come on. Town of Moraga. County of Napa and all five Napa cities. Yes, for them too. City of Nevada. Yes. City of Oakley. Yes. City of Pano. Yes. City of Pittsburgh. Yes. City of Richmond. Town of Ross. City of San Anselmo. Yes. San Pablo. City of San Rafael. City of San Ramon. Yes. City of Sausalito and the city of No Valley. Yes. County of Solano. Town of Tiburon. City of Walnut Creek. Aye. Thank you. Great, thank you. Let's see. I just did something funny to myself, so hopefully I'll get back. Um, all right, so moving on to item eight in our agenda, which is really an administrative matter. It's a resolution appointing the director of finance as treasurer, uh, which I'm assuming involves Garth, but Dawn, did you want to explain what this is about? Yeah, um, this is simply a, um, an annual requirement that we need to make an appointment um, of the Director of Finance. But Garth or Catalina, would you like to make any further comments on this? All right, hearing none, uh, would someone like to make a motion? Patterson moves. Do I have a second? To approve. Lyman seconds. Um, uh, and Darlene, here we go again. Oh boy. Oh, and Darlene, um, as you go through, it's okay if you want to not say city of or town of or county of, that might make it go a little faster. <clears throat> Belvedere? Yes. Benicia? Yes. Concord? Contra Costa County? Yes. Puerto Madeira? Yes. Danville? Yes. El Cerrito? Yes. Fairfax? Yes. Lafayette? Yes. Larkspur? Yes. County of Marin? Yes. Martinez? Moraga? County of Napa and all five Napa cities? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Nevado? Yes. Oakley? Yes. Pinot? Yes. Pittsburgh? Yes. Yeah. Richmond? San Anselmo, town of Ross. Yes. Richmond? Ross? San Anselmo? Yes. Thank you. San Pablo? San Rafael? San Ramon? Yes. City of Sausalito? Yes. City of <laughs> Sausalito? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Walnut Creek? Yes. County of Solano and town of Tiburon. Thank you. Thank you, Darlene. I think we're convinced that none of us want your job. 
Um, all right, we're moving on. Next is the amendment to the MCE investment policy. Don or Garth, you want to just introduce this item? Yeah, yeah. sure. I'll, I'll take it. I'll take it, Don. That's fine. Um, that's okay. So, yeah. yeah. So, um, we review the investment policy annually, um, and there was uh, a change in the California code this year, um, which uh, um, increased the amount of a certain investment that MCE uses quite regularly, um, which is um, in FDIC insured placement service deposits. And so the law in California changed from um, that any uh, public entity could have as much as 30% of their investments in these FDIC insured deposits. Um, and the law changed to increase that to 50%. Um, now, uh, MCE actually utilizes this, in, in this investment vehicle quite a bit. Um, it's extremely liquid. Uh, it's just like a money market account, um, yet it has a, a very high yield. It, um, it yields um, uh, the local agency investment fund rate plus 10 basis points for us. So it gives us a very, very good yield and complete liquidity. So again, it's something we, we will continue to use and, um, and we'll, we'll be putting more of our portfolio. We generally keep about 25% in this investment um, to stay under the 30% limit. But now that um, the limit is going up to 50%, we'd like to change our investment policy to reflect that. And we'll keep on average about 40% of our cash in these, um, these ICS accounts. So um, that's what we're proposing today and hoping for board approval to amend our investment policy to reflect that. Super, thank you, Garth. Any questions or comments from the board? All right, any comments from the public? Hearing none, I'd entertain a motion to approve. I'm, I'm for green moves to approve. I have a question. I'm sorry, this is Barbara Kohler, I was muted. Okay. Did we skip item 10 about appointing the director of finance as treasurer? We're no, that was item eight and we just did it and now we're on item nine. Oh, okay, I must be looking at an old packet. Ah, okay. Right. Excuse me, sorry, apologize. No worries. Thank you. All right, did I have a second to that motion? I'll give you a second, this is Kevin from Lawrence. Oh, thank you, Kevin. All right, Darlene. <laughs> right. God. <laughs> <laughs> So, Oh, sorry, here, yes. Benicia? Yes. Concord? Contra Costa County? Yes. Quarter Madeira? Yes. Danville? Yes. <laughs> El Cerrito? Yes. Fairfax? Yes. Lafayette? Yes. Larkspur? Yes. County of Marin? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Moraga? County of Napa and all five Napa cities? Napa, yes. Novato? Yes. Oakley? Yes. Pinole? Yes. Pittsburgh? Yes. Richmond? Ross? Town of San Anselmo? Yes. San Pablo? San Rafael? San Ramon? Yes. City of Sausalito? Yes. And the city of Mill Valley. Thank you. County of Solano. Tiburon. Walnut Creek. Aye. Thank you. All right, good. Thank you, Darlene. Uh, and now we're going to move to item 10 on our agenda, which is the budget for fiscal year 2020-21. Garth and, and Maida. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to try to do something here, see if I can share my screen with everyone that is looking at a screen. Um, and in the meantime, I know, Dawn, did you want to say anything before we get started on this? 
Yeah, I have a couple of things um, I wanted to say kind of by, by way of introduction on this item. Um, every year we um, go through the budget setting process um, at this time, and as, as you all may recall, our fiscal year starts on April 1. So um, this is the time where we, we uh, get everything in place to, um, to uh, get the wheels in motion for that fiscal year beginning. And, you know, a couple of things that are themes for this year, you know, we've really seen NCE go through um, uh, a lot of changes in the last year as far as um, maturing in many different areas. And this includes our ability to use software and tools. Um, we've grown quite a bit as an agency, you know, as far as our, our budget, uh, our number of programs have increased tenfold just in the last couple of years. Um, and, and we're uh, managing between two offices. And so we've um, really focused a lot of time over the last year on creating tools and efficiencies um, where we can, um, where you know, manual efforts used to work really well at the beginning. Um, once you get to a certain scale, it's better to invest in some tools to um, allow you to um, not do things manually and do things um, you know, in, a, in a wider scale. Um, we've also increased the amount of um, staff expertise that's needed um, and the level of responsibility. I, you know, I think when we were a startup agency, um, we, you know, there were um, kind of the rules, the lay of the land for CCAs was still getting figured out, um, but now there's a lot of clarity around what's needed and a lot of responsibility to, um, to act appropriately within the confines of um, of what CCAs are expected to do. So with that increase in maturity and responsibility and needed expertise, um, we've definitely seen some increased costs on the staffing front, um, some increased costs on the data and software front, which you'll see reflected in the budget. Um, and the increase in our programs has really driven also an increase in our needs for staffing and, and uh, data software tools. So that's just some of the, the narrative or the backdrop behind what Garth is going to talk about now. Um, the last thing I want to touch on is that um, we, as we've brought in um, uh, new programs um, through our grants and our CPUC funds, we've um, needed to create some new positions. Um, we've created a strategic initiatives department that's focused on implementing a lot of our programs, including the resiliency funds that were set up last year. Um, and in order to attract and retain the best and the brightest on our staff team, we've made a lot of improvements over the last year to benefits um, for staff. Um, medical um, coverage for families, dental coverage has been improved. Um, and we've also increased some um, personal development um, investments that have really helped with um, staff retention. So um, I just wanted to provide that backdrop before we jump into the details, and I'll hand it over to you, Garth. Great. Thank you, Don. That was a great overview. Garth? Yes, thanks, Don. So I want to make sure, so can people see um, the, on your screens the proposed budget? Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mel. Yeah. For those that are calling in, um, uh, Darlene sent around um, a copy of this this PowerPoint presentation as well, which is really just um, different pages with, um, with the numbers. So um, to the extent um, you can, if you're looking at that or looking at on your own screen, um, I'll try to indicate as I'm moving through. So, um, so every year around this time, uh, the MCE staff presents uh, proposed budgets for the, for the fiscal year. Fiscal year runs from um, April 1st through March 31st. And so we're now talking about the fiscal 2020 and 21 fiscal year. So the budgets, if they're approved by the board, they, it allows staff to spend the operating funds within the limits and contingencies built into each budget line item um, and fund the local renewable energy and program development fund. And now this year, fund any additions to MCE's resiliency fund and then add you know, MCE's operating fund balances and reserves with, with whatever's left over at the end of the year. So I'm showing up on the screen right now, and if you're following along at home, um, the, I think everyone's following along at home tonight anyway. So um, um, it is a look at the current fiscal year's amended budget, which we amended in the fall to reflect um, really the rate increases that went into effect in July, um, next to the proposed 
2021 budget, which will run again from April 1st of this year through March 31st, 2021. So we're talking about, again, this is the proposed budget. So it's $445 million in projected revenues um, and cost of energy of around $370 million, um, an operating fund budget um, of about 31 million and leaving us with a net operating income of approximately $45 million. Um, and interest earnings and others that get us to a projected um, change in net position of about $48 million. Now, I think I need to preface this whole budget discussion a little bit with, um, you know, there, as, as we're all witnessing and, and realizing here, it's a lot going on. Um, there will be a lot going on with, um, with MCE's load, uh, certainly, and we certainly expect um, some, some pretty dramatic effects potentially on, and particularly on our commercial load here. Um, we have been tracking this pretty closely um, um, and actually haven't seen a whole lot of reduction here in these first few days of, of shelter in place. Um, but we do expect, expect to see in particular some, some effects uh, on our commercial load um, over the course of the year and until we, we get through this period. Um, um, countering that somewhat, we do expect to see some increases in our, in our residential load as people stay at home, work from home, and so on. So I just wanted to emphasize that um, this proposed budget at this point, you know, we've been working on this now for you know, six plus weeks, um, does not reflect um, any, any real effects of, of COVID-19. Um, and its effects on our economy. Uh, but um, again, as we, as we see what this effect is gonna be, and as we realize it over the, you know, the next few months, we'll probably be necessarily be back to the board with budget amendments to reflect whatever, uh, whatever reduction in loads we might see in, in revenues and so on. Okay, so um, here's a, a blow up of uh, the top line. And, and in this case, we're, just looking again at energy revenue, we expect energy revenue to be up um, about 7%. And that's primarily reflective of the rate increase, a full years of the rate increase that we, we implemented last year. Um, we really don't expect a whole, we have a slight increase in a number of accounts reflective of Solano County addition, um, unincorporated. Um, but total energy load is projected to be about the same next year, you know, in this current budget projection. Um, Energy expense is anticipated, projected to go up by about 11%. And this is primarily reflecting um, higher prices for system energy, local resource adequacy. And I think as Don mentioned earlier, the need to purchase additional GHG free energy to meet our 90% target. Our next is a, um, a snapshot of um, the operating fund budget and Again, looking at um, energy revenue, um, cost of energy, getting us to our net, and then all our operating fund um, line items. And we project um, at total operating expenses for the next fiscal year of approximately uh, $31 million. So as Don had mentioned or, you know, earlier, we have created two new departments, um, one in part in response to the PSPS events and to assist our most disadvantaged customers. Um, and so this strategic initiative department is designed to manage and direct all that we're doing in resiliency, microgrids, storage, and to be sure we're addressing all the needs of our most disadvantaged customers. And also, as, as Dawn has mentioned as well, we re, uh, reduced our outside costs for data storage and, an and analytics and created a new technology and analytics department that'll take over a lot of these functions. Um, uh, we anticipate that technology and analytics will dramatically improve our ability to mine and analyze a massive amount of customer data that MCC collects every year. Um, and this will entail a sizable investment in software and cloud computing capability. Um, but we do anticipate these better analytics will allow us to better procure and schedule for energy, to be more predictive about our customer behavior. And you know, as they, as they receive the price signals from our adoption of the 49 peak, time of use, and other billing protocols, and it will allow MCE to bring true tailored customer service through initiatives to bear on our, through these analytics. So do you wanna talk about personnel costs? Um, um, Dawn had certainly mentioned this as well. And personnel costs are projected to increase by 
uh, the next fiscal year and represent the most, most of the proposed budget increase year over year. Um, these increases are driven by a number of factors, uh, primarily an increase of 63 to 70 full-time employees, uh, which include a net increase of four, including two director level personnel staff with the two new departments that were just mentioned. Um, additional higher skilled and higher paid staff to backfill existing and fill new needed areas to implement all these new programs. Um, a eight to 9% increase reflected in salaries, uh, reflective of the Bay Area cost of living adjustment and merit raises. And then finally, sort of just the in improvements in the quality and types and total benefit packages to remain competitive with other CCAs and other public utilities and private companies in the Bay Area. Um, as was mentioned in the staff report, MCE is habitually the, um, the proving ground for, for talent and uh, other CCAs rate us regularly um, you know, as they um, are, are created and grow. So we've, we've just lost many, many um, valued employees to the other CCAs, which we have to then backfill with you know, equally as experienced and talented people. So um, it's a constant upgrading that, we, uh, that we're doing year to year. Um, also wanted to mention that as you know, other municipal utilities and city enterprise operations offer lifetime benefit pension packages and other post-retirement benefits. Well, MC does not do that. And by securing better and more comprehensive real-time benefits, MC can better attract and retain top tier talent. So all of our employee compensation and benefits are paid out in real time in our budget each year. So these additional personnel and comp guys, yeah. could I could I interject one comment sure. here? I just wanted to um, point out something that's in the staff report, but um, in, in case it got lost or buried um, as folks were going through the material, I think it's worth noting that the um, the growth of the CCA industry across the state has really um, taken a toll on MCE's ability to retain staff and attract staff to some degree. As you mentioned, Garth, I just wanted to put a, put a finer point on it, that um, just in the last uh, couple of years, MCE's lost a total of nine full-time employees to other CCAs. Um, in addition, four full-time employees went to private companies that directly serve the CCA industry in the private sector. Um, and then two full-time employees went to the statewide CCA Trade Association. Um, and of these 15 employees, four were director level, uh, 12 had highly specialized expertise. And so I just wanted to um, make sure that was fresh in people's minds, that that does take a toll on the agency and um, is a reason why we've really spent a lot of time in the last year um, focusing on making MCE a place where um, folks want to apply and, and stay working. Sorry, Garth, go ahead. That's no, okay. No, absolutely don't. Thanks. Um, so uh, that's really it on the, um, the personnel budget line. I just want to um, pause for a second and see if um, uh, any uh, director has any questions or comments. Uh, Garth, Bob McCaskill. Um, yeah, you know, I may not have clearly stated uh, what my question was when the executive council went, went over this budget uh, earlier this month, but um, I think uh, I mean, you indicate in the budget that there's a 35% increase in personnel compensation, but as you point out in the staff report, that includes some new positions, new departments, and so forth. I think most of us in our local city council processes are n normally used to seeing what the percentage increase in total compensation benefits is for the existing staff. And so that's still what I'm, I, I'd be interested in knowing is what is the, what are you proposing as the average percentage increase for staff compensation, including merit raises, cost of living adjustments, fringe benefit increases uh, for the existing uh, employees? Okay, um, I don't have that number on the top of my head, Director McCaskill, um, but we can certainly provide that. Um, so when we talked about it before, I thought you were more asking about the percentage increases. So I went into more detail in the, in the staff report um, uh, to sort of break out which, which was, what was representing that 35% increase um, between the total number of new employees, um, um, higher wages and um, the cost of living and merit increases and so on. So I broke it out that way, but not specifically of the existing employees, what the total increase in compensation and benefits was year to year. So I can do that. Um, yeah, I think, I, think that, 
I think that would be helpful. I mean, the, yeah. the piece that's, that gets thrown in here is new departments and new employees, and that uh, when you throw that into the number, of course, we have no idea if you're proposing to to give the average employee a five percent increase or a fifty percent increase or what. And I, I think that's something we really ought to know. Right. Okay. And I can and I can certainly do that. Yeah, and I just want to clarify that we're not looking for board approval of specific uh, staff benefits at this time. This is really a, a higher level exercise where we're just um, approving a, a budget for the coming year. Just a reminder to folks to go on mute if you're not speaking. Okay. Um, any other questions on personnel? Okay, so I'll be go going down the, uh, the line items here. Um, so these next three items, um, data manager, technical scheduling services and, ser and, and service fees, these are, these are projected costs and are completely in line with our contracts, which are primarily based on the number of contracts we service each month, accounts, I'm sorry, the accounts we service each month. I would highlight that the data, data manager line where these expenses are expected to go down by almost a half a million dollars. And this reflects the renegotiated contract and the expectation that MC will bring in some of this data storage and analysis services in-house with the addition of the technology and analytics department. Again, the service fees from PG&E are on a formulaic basis and um, really just reflect um, slight increase in, in the number of accounts. Um, so legal and policy communications and other services. Um, these aligned items um, are reflective of the areas driving some of the increases in total the operating budget. So legal costs continue to go up by no fault of the legal department as uh, each area of MCE gets more technical in nature. Each area must often retain outside legal expertise to assist in these efforts. Finance is no exception. We anticipate retaining a number of outside law firms to help with a number of initiatives that the finance department would like to pursue. Um, these expensive roll, now roll up under the legal department. Uh, communications and other services, uh, these increases are reflective of the need for marketing and sponsorships related to our resiliency efforts, enrolling new communities and associated communications related to the new rates programs. Um, again, and all the resiliency work we're doing and to continue to market the MCE and our value proposition as pg &E emerges from bankruptcy later this year. Greg Lyman, El Cerrito. Yes, great. Uh, the communication services, the staff report does not indicate that it's an in increase in staff. Is there any additional staff associated with the communication services? Um, I don't know. I'm sorry, Heather, are you on the line? Yes, I'm here. Sorry about that. No, um, we um, are at the same um, headcount as we were in last year's budget. So this is largely driven by um, advertising. Um, we're going to be doing a lot more. Uh, you'll see advertising at you know bus stops and um, cable TV, local newspapers, digital advertising, and then also the compliance mailers that we send out when we enroll new communities. Those. Um, are fairly expensive, and we have two uh, large communities joining us in early 2021. Great, thank you. Okay. The next um, couple of items are other services and GNA, and these expense increases are a result of reallocating and increasing funding for some of the software that's been mentioned. The data management systems, including setting up a data warehouse moving many terabytes of this data in-house and associated cloud computing costs, um, standing up a CRM system and the consulting costs and software licenses associated with that effort. Uh, the next is occupancy and financing contingency. Um, occupancy expenses are expected to remain basically constant, reflective of the existing leases and associated expenses. Uh, the finance budget, budget is actually going down as certain of these finance expenses have been reallocated to other more appropriate line items, including some software under GNA and legal expenses, as mentioned, under the legal department. So um, if you recall, last year we embedded all the contingency in the budget in finance and reduced it from approximately 10% of the entire budget to down to 4% of the budget. This has worked out really well in that we only expect to need a small part of that contingency for one line item in the current fiscal year. 
So looking at the um, overall budget, the highlighted yellow area for 2020 and 21. So given our current projections of energy sales, energy expenses, operating expenses, so on, we anticipate producing um, in addition to MCE's net position of about $48 million. Um, we have some capital outlay. Uh, we're gonna request, request tonight a an additional transfer to the resiliency fund of an, a, another $3 million. We would like to transfer to the local renewable energy and program development fund, approximately $2.4 million for the lift program and others. Um, and so those transfers um, after that, um, Another net, I'm sorry, operating um, and non-operating earnings um, have us a net increase in the operating fund balance of approximately $42 million. So I'd like to now turn it over to Maida Strauss, who's going to talk about some of the individual uh, fund budgets. This, this is uh, Greg Lyman again. On the uh, agreed, we're only putting $42 million towards our net budget, but on a previous slide, you showed that the net budget would be then a Approximately 200 million. Uh, yes, in terms of the, our, our accumulated um, uh, net position, absolutely. Um, and and what's the target? What's the target of the accumulated net position? Um, the well, we're going to we're going to hit the current well the, the current target that was for this year. We're going to hit, and we've increased uh, the reserve amounts, um, the reserve targets as well, Ray. So um, we are scheduled, or I should say we are targeting um, a reserve amount of 60% of our operating budget by the, end, by the end of the fiscal year 2022. So we're currently, a little, we're probably at like 45% or so. I'm kind of doing this off the top of my head. We anticipate at the end of this year. Um, and then, so to get to 60%, and again, so 60% of effectively of our revenue, um, we would have to, you know, have a, another couple of good years to hit to hit sixty percent. It, it's six. Sorry, this is Greg Lyman. Six sixty percent of net revenue, which is like half a billion. Um, no, it's not. It's it's um, the reserve target is sixty percent of our revenue number. So this top not top line number up here. Okay, so it's the accumulated reserve. Yeah, that's, that's close to a half billion. Let's, that's right. Let's be fair, it's a half billion. 60% yep. of that is 300 million? Um, 445, um, let's see, 60, it's, it's, it's well above 200. I don't think it's 300 million. Did you say 300? Only because I'm rounding that up to half billion. Uh, but we're at, we're just, getting to 160 now so you think we'll be at that whatever number you're calculating by two fiscal years or yeah so we will be um after we add you know the the addition to net position here um at the end of this at the end of this fiscal year which you know is in a few weeks um it is we project that it's, it's, again, it's a goal. Um, it's a liquidity and, um, and reserve goal that, and it's a stretch goal, admittedly, that we would try to, we would try to reach that point of about 260 million by, by the end of 2022. Thank you. All right, um, I'd like to turn it over to Maida. Thank you, Garth. Um, we can go to the next slide now. Okay, so uh, besides the MC operating fund that Garth has just presented, MC has another three funds. And the one we have, we're gonna start with the one we have it up on the screen, which is the Local Renewable Energy and Program Development Fund. This one, is funded through the half cent of the one cent deep green premium, plus the pledged amount of to support MCE's electric vehicle program, the MCEV. So this is the on the revenue side. Now, when we move to the expense side, this fund uh, supports efforts of the MCEV and also rebates for solar installation for low-income family residences. 
We are also partnering with other Bay Area CCAs and the Bay Area Regional Energy Network to co-fund a program aimed at increasing adoption of electric grid-enabled heat water uh, pumps. Uh, Garfin, next. So we're gonna move to the next uh, fund. So this one is the Resilience Fund. So in November of last year, MCU's board approved the creation of the Resilience Fund with initial funding of $3 million. The fund was originally created in large part as a response to PG&E PSVS events as they significantly impact our most vulnerable customers. So staff anticipates that over 250,000 of this fund will be spent in this current fiscal year to cover early stage programs implementation. Um, we recommend an additional funding of $3 million for the fiscal year 2021, bringing the total funding to $6 million. So, the next, the next and the last fund we have is the Energy Efficiency Program Fund. It uses funding authorized by the CPUC to support programs such as the multifamily, uh, the low-income families and tenants program, the LIFT, as well as workforce development programs. I also would like to uh, touch that the EE funds also reimburse MCE operational budget for certain staff time dedicated to implementing those programs. So we transfer funds from the energy efficiency fund to back to MC operational budget to cover for the, the some staff time. So now we cover all MCE's um, uh, funds and I will pass it back to Garf for some final remarks. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Maida. So uh, again, as I mentioned at the beginning of, of, of this item, um, you know, the budget for next year, in particular, in particular the projection for sales, um, energy costs, and some operating expenses are, are just that projections. Um, so I think um, MC staff and consultants do a very good job um, with projecting load and procuring energy to meet that load and managing the business day to day and month to month. However, given all that's going on and, and what we might expect to happen to the local economy reflective of uh, COVID-19 and other effects um, that it's, you know, it's quite likely that some of these projections won't be borne out. So um, we would come back to the board potentially for some budget amendments uh, once we know more. Um, but again, some of these, some of the things that could affect uh, these projections include um, the, um, the effects of the changes in pg and rates and, and the PCIA and they could have an effect on some on customer retention. Um, direct access, we've, we have some sort of sense of what that's gonna to do to some of MCE's load, but we don't have a complete picture there. Um, and you know, there are a number of fundamental rate adjustments being implemented, including, including time of use and so on. And we don't quite know how customers will react to, the, to, to these new price signals. So um, rooftop solar adoption continues apace. Um, and we've yet, yet to see the full effects of the battery storage programs and, and what we're trying to do as well in the service area. So these, these changing and evolving events may affect our projections and revenues and expenses. And as mentioned, staff would come back to the board potentially uh, for a budget um, amendment throughout the fiscal 2021 fiscal year. So um, XCOM uh, approved the proposed budget unanimously at the uh, last XCOM meeting. Um, and we're recommending that they, the board approve the 2020-21 um, operating fund budget, the EE fund budget, the local renewable energy and program development fund budget, and the resiliency budget. Super. Thank, thanks very much, Garth and Maida. Are there questions from the board? Greg Lyman? Yeah, Greg. Um, I, I have no doubt on the budget, but I do want, we have some, Somewhere in my memory, we had a risk analysis of various risks. I was just curious if we've updated that risk analysis to include the loss of revenue associated with the COVID-19 uh, shelter in place. So do you have any sense of what the, 
what aspects of our business line are potentially going to see uh, revenue losses or revenue changes as a result of the COVID-19? Well, we have certainly started to um, do some, some analysis, which really, Greg, are, are, as you can imagine, are just our projections at this point. As I think I mentioned um, early on on this, um, we really haven't seen a whole lot in terms of, of, of reductions in load. I mean, we, we sort of see the interval data at something like a four-day lag. Um, so we're just now beginning to potentially, you know, just to see if there's been any, um, any real effects uh, from, from this, but we absolutely anticipate that there's going to be some potentially really pretty dramatic effects, in particular with some of the smaller commercial um, uh, rate categories. So um, we have done, we have run some analysis um, um, in, and even our most pessimistic, pessimistic analyses um, sort of indicated that, um, you know, that NCE would, would be okay. Because in addition to when, when we have, we have loss of load, we have energy that we can sell into the, um, into the CAISO market. So depending upon what we project those CAISO markets to look like, um, uh, you know, we, you know, sometimes it's really not that much of a loss for NCE. So, um, so we do have projections. Um, again, they're very, very early. Um, um, and they, they show that, um, you know, even in some of our in the very worst assumptions that MC is, is still going to be positive for the next fiscal year in terms, you know, of our net position. So, um, uh, but again, we, it's just so much unknown at this point. Um, and, Great. Thank you. Okay. Other questions, comments from the board? Yeah. Ray, Ray with Yeah. Um, so uh, first a question, which is the th 3 million transfer into the resiliency fund, is that sort of a number that was derived by what we felt we could reasonably afford? Or is there some deeper analytics and sort of future programming thoughts that have arrived at that number? So that's a question, and then I do have a comment. Um, I think uh, we didn't really know uh, what what we needed to put in there. Certainly, we did as we did it last year to just start that fund, Ray. Um, and you know, we what we do know, I think, at this point is that, um, and why we're requesting another three million dollars, um, that that is you know, that's gonna, that could be spent very, very quickly depending upon what we try to achieve with that fund. So there was no, I, I can't say that there was any robust analysis around trying to size that up, those amounts. Um, um, and as we learn more about what it might take to set up certain microgrids and to assist, assist those being set up, mm -hmm. I mean, it gets pretty expensive pretty quickly. So um, we tried to and find Darth, a place. I'm happy to yeah. jump yeah, in on do. this as please well. Yeah. And, and I see Jamie is with us. She might want to chime in. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say that the, you know, the initial $3 million that was um, put into the fund late last year, we really saw as seed funding to um, try and attract other dollars, as we've done with the Marine Community Foundation, and to leverage other programs out there like the SGIP funds, the um, Self-Generation Incentive Program, which has a, a, a very uh, – deep uh, investment available for equity communities. Um, but in order to access those funds, we kind of need a, a mechanism in place, uh, a vendor to provide support to us. And um, so we, we are expecting that the initial $3 million um, is going to go a long way to get a lot of those programs in place. Um, but there's definitely, a, you know, as Garth was saying, there's um, a need for a bit more because three million um, uh, is it's a you know it's it's a, a very good start and we've been able to make a lot of progress with that um, I, but an additional three million we think will get us to where we want to be this year um, with regards to resiliency I don't think it makes sense for us to be going beyond that amount at this point given the other partners and the other pools of money that are out there. Um, but it, it, based on our analysis, it seems to be the right size of a resiliency fund in order to attract other dollars that are out there. Um, but Jamie, do you have anything you want to add on to what I just said? Yeah. Um, good evening, everyone. I would just add on that we are um, 
we're very busy right now um, building out these resiliency programs that we're going to be offering to customers very shortly. Um, we're working on how we can provide battery backup power, uh, battery combined with solar for our um, customers throughout our service area. So critical facilities, um, residents and businesses and really prioritizing um, vulnerable customers. And like Dawn said, we're looking to leverage SGIP funds, which are available from the CPUC um, that can also help fund these projects. So um, additional funds from MCE can be a bridge to really help get these projects completed. Um, we're in the process of building out a new battery energy storage program. Um, you, some of you heard at a recent executive committee meeting about the, um, and Dawn mentioned it today in her uh, report about the uh, portable battery giveaway for our low income medical baseline customers um, and a couple of other programs as well. And we'll be presenting more information about these to the board. Um, so we're looking forward to sharing the information as these programs are uh, developed and prepared to roll out for our customers. Uh, thank you for that. And uh, by the way, the basis of my question was not in any way to um, question that. I, I think this is very important. It's really a drop in the bucket in the grand scheme of things. And so um, I'm very supportive. And my comment was simply to sort of add on to that and say I'm extremely supportive of this budget. I think um, uh, for any um, of the directors who are concerned and seeing some of the large increases on some of the line items uh, personnel and the other various ones. This is, in my experience, um, exactly what you will be seeing as you scale the organization. And so I'm um, incredibly supportive of where you're going here. Super. <clears throat> Thank you, Ray. <clears throat> Any other uh, questions or comments from board members? This is uh, Kevin. I just wanted to uh, uh, reinforce what Ray just said. I mean, we've we've had these discussions in the executive committee, and you know, to me, this budget reflects um, uh, not only growth but maturity in the organization. And um, I think it's important for us to uh, support um, the way we're organizing our finances, and we're doing that in a variety of different ways. That'll be, I think, some of those ways will be discussed later on in the evening. Um, so I share the sentiments that Ray just expressed. Um, I think this is a good budget. Um, we're in challenging times, but um, uh, I think we're in a position to be resilient uh, with respect to some of the challenges that we're facing. So I'm hoping we'll get uh, folks to um, uh, support it tonight. Thank you, Kevin. Any other comments or questions from board members? Would someone like to make a motion? Just a, a quick comment. After the, uh, this is David Kuhnhart, alternate from Corte Madera. After the MCCMC last meeting, which had a discussion on microgrids, there a group of us got together and had a follow-on conversation. There is a tremendous amount of interest and motivation to advance the resiliency program. So I'm very happy to see that it's uh, doubling up in size. Great. Thank you. Scott Perkins, I move adoption of the budget as presented. Ray Whitty, I second, second that. <laughs> we're, all we're all competing, so that's fine. Seconds, that's a good thing. All right, we have a motion and a second. Darlene, we need a roll call. And Director Sears, I wonder if we want to pause for a public comment in case any members of the public have joined. Oh, I'm happy to. I just lost belief that there were members of the public. <laughs> if there are any members of the public, you're welcome to comment on the proposed budget. All right. Convinced that there are not any, we should move forward. Early. All right. Belvedere. Um, I'll vote yes, but with a reservation, as I had voiced at the executive committee meeting, I think it would be prudent uh, that the board be advised as soon as possible as how much of the personnel cost increases for new departments and new positions versus the percentage increase in compensation for existing employees. Thank you. 
Benicia. And I will, yes, and I also want to support Ray's uh, comments about the resiliency fund. I think it's really critical. Concord. Contra Costa County. Yes. Puerto Madera. Yes. Danville. Yes. El Cerrito. Yes. Fairfax. Yes. Lafayette. Yes. Larkspur. Yes. County of Marin. Yes. Martinez. Moraga. County of Napa and all Napa cities. Yes. Nevado. Yes. Oakley. Yes. Pano. Yes. Pittsburgh. Yes. Richmond. Ross. San Anselmo. San Pablo. San Rafael. San Ramon. Yes. Sausalito and Mill Valley. Yes. Solano County, Tiburon, Walnut Creek. Aye. Thank you. Thank you, Darlene. All right, so we have two more substantive items on our agenda. I want to thank everyone for hanging in. At least we have no travel time to get home tonight. Um, and the next one is item 11, which is the dynamic rates for upcoming Solano inclusion. Justin Kudo, I think you're on base. Dawn, did you want to say anything to introduce this before Justin takes it away? Nope, it's all yours, Justin. Okay. Great, thank you very much. And I also wanted to apologize if anyone caught my daughter running around on my webcam earlier. Uh, I hope you <laughs> enjoyed seeing her as much as I did. Um, <laughs> Uh, good evening. Uh, tonight, what I'm going to be talking about is a rate adjustment proposal to ensure customer cost certainty for the new customers, which are part of the upcoming unincorporated Solano County inclusion. I'm also joined by Jenna Famular from our public affairs team to answer any questions that you may have about marketing, education, and outreach efforts for the inclusion itself. The first question on most customers' minds when we have an inclusion period is how our rates compare with pg &E's. And I think that's a really positive story for us as well. We're a little less than pg &E, essentially at parity right now, and we've been less for a couple of years. Our marketing materials describe these rates as cost competitive with pg &E, in part because customers are not just concerned with where our rates are today, but where they will be. Our goal with this proposal is to provide incoming new Solano County customers with greater certainty over their bills with MCE through their first year of service. The dynamic rate proposal would enable staff to change rates for these customers throughout the year, adjusting them to maintain cost parity with PG&E in the same way that today's rates do. The staff is confident that this would be positive on the customer experience as well as understanding and at the same time empower our marketing, outreach, and customer service operations. The necessity for this proposal is due to an unusually turbulent year of rate changes for PG&E. Usually MC's enrollments have come following PG&E's major rate change for the year, which typically happens in January. That enables us to communicate the relative position of MC rates for several months during the enrollment, and after the enrollment, often through the end of the year. But this year, pg and is having an unusual year of rate setting due to delayed filings, PCIA changes, and other factors. So as a result, we're now forecasting three separate impactful rate changes over the next eight months. The first of these changes is expected on May 1st. We have received clear, a clear picture of what that rate change will look like as of last week, but the final rates will still not be available until the end of April in the midst of the customer inclusion period. <clears throat> we generally now expect that PG&E's generation rates will remain flat, <clears throat> excuse me, which is an improvement from the um, original wording in the staff report, um, but the PCIA fees will still be increasing. 
We are also expecting some rate changes in October or November, which may include a PCIA spike, in part due to uncollected marginal PCIA from the first four uh, due to the delay in the PCIA rate setting for the year. And we would then expect pg and &E standard annual rate change next January. To mitigate the impacts of these changes on customer bills, staff created a new approach for a rate setting, which we've named dynamic rates. Dynamic rates would be flexible rates, which change as soon as possible following any pg and &E rate change. Unincorporated Solano County customers would follow standard MC rates until the next pg and &E rate change expected on May 1st. Then if MC effective rates were higher than those of pg and &E's, staff would then calculate the necessary rates for parity and update customer billing as soon as possible. This approach is only proposed to be applied to customers within the in current inclusion period given the unique rate climate that we find ourselves in and it would apply through April of 2021. Directing staff to continuously adjust unincorporated Solano County rates would effectively isolate these customers from any pg and &E caused price volatility through their first year of service at a relatively low cost or risk to MCE. Staff analysis expects this adjustable rate approach will have a cost of just under two million. Uh, that number would actually be a little bit lower now updated pg and &E figures, and that assumes a 93% rate of MC participation in the new area, service area. That equates to approximately half a percent of MC's projected revenues for the upcoming fiscal year. <clears throat> the recommendation is for the board to direct staff to implement dynamic rates for new customers in Solano County by adjusting rates for these customers as necessary to maintain cost parity or savings compared to pg and &E customer costs. And uh, with that, I will open it up to questions. Great. Thank you, Justin. Any questions or comments from the board? Yes. So this dynamic rate, this is Scott Bernie, Santa Monica. This dynamic rate program only applies to the Solano or the, the people that will be signing up in Solano County, is that correct? That's correct, yes. Okay, well, um, we haven't yet come up with a program going forward for our current customers elsewhere. When will we be doing that? Yeah, I can speak to that if you'd like, Justin. Um, we are going to be monitoring rate changes um, that pg and &E has teed up over the course of the summer and the fall and um, we'll be determining when is the right time to um, bring uh, any potential rate changes to the board. Um, right now, it, it definitely seems too soon because there's so many par moving parts, as Justin outlined, um, but we'll be talking about this at the committee level and then um, determining the best course of action to come to the board um, either later this year or early next year, depending on the outcomes. And I also wanted to point out that I see Director Kohler has her hand raised. Yes, thank you. Um, so my question is, I think this is a great idea. I support it. I'm just wondering if the need to adjust rates, would you plan on going to the executive committee to discuss those rate changes? Or is it just we're directing staff to go ahead and um, you know, use best judgment to do so? Yeah, so the action tonight is um, would be um, not needing to come back to the executive committee for the new Solano customers, um, but for any other rate changes, um, we would typically go to the executive committee first and then go to the full board for any um, major rate changes. Okay, thank you. Director Patterson. So aren't any other comments? I'd be happy to move approval for the staff to implement the dynamic rates for the new customers in Solana County. Super. All second, Denise Sappas. Well, thank you both. Any further comment? All right, Darlene, roll call. <coughs> Belvedere? Yes. Benicia? Yes. Concord, Contra Costa County, Gwinnett.
Twitter, Madeira? Yes. Dan Bill? Yes. El Cerrito? Yes. Fairfax? Yes. Lafayette? Yes. Larkspur? Yes. County of Marin? Yes. Martinez? Moraga? County of Napa and all five Napa cities? Yes. Nevada? Yes. Oakley? Yes. Pano? Pittsburgh? Richmond? Yes. Yeah. Was that Pittsburgh saying yes? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Ross? San Antonio? San Pablo? San Rafael? San Ramon? Yes. Sausalito and Mill Valley? Yes. County of Solano? Tiburon? Wilma Creek? Yes. Thank Perfect. you. Thank you, Darlene. All right, so we are on our last substantive item, which is number 12, <clears throat> Steps and Considerations for MC to Access Tax-Exempt Capital Markets. Garth. And I'm so sorry, but before we jump into that item, I wanted to um, notice that I see Director Salimi um, uh, here potentially, and um, he may have been on mute when we did that last um, roll call. Same is true with Director Butt. I, I see that you seem to be uh, dialed in here but um, we haven't heard your votes. So um, if Director Salimi or Director Butt are there, can you let us know before we move on to the next item? Okay, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> that was a good effort. All right, okay. You tried. <laughs> Absolutely, let's move on to item 12, Garth. Okay. Um, Hello again, everyone. Um, so again, I want to sh see if I can share my screen here. Um, okay, so I want to check with folks. Can you see that on your screens? Yes. Steps and considerations yes. for MCE to access the tax exempt capital markets. And um, once again, Darlene sent this around as well. So either you have it on your, your screen at home or, or maybe a, a physical copy. So I'll be sort of walking through this PowerPoint presentation. Um, so it's been mentioned a couple times in the past. Uh, um, uh, and up, uh, let me just stop for a second. Um, Vic and I don't know, did, did you want to um, say anything here before I get started on this topic? Um, no, Garth, uh, you're good to go. The only thing I would recommend you to mention is the situation we are in now as you're making the presentation. But I don't have anything to start with now. Thank you. Okay. All right. Great. Um, so uh, MCE has an opportunity to uh, take the necessary early steps to prepare to issue tax exempt municipal bonds. Um, we would do this to finance an ownership interest potentially in a generation or storage facility. Um, but again, only if and when an opportunity presents itself and it's the, sort of the right thing to do from MCE's standpoint. So, um, for example, MC, we could issue bonds to finance um, ownership interest in a resource facility or a microgrid. Um, and, you know, issuing bonds would be a, a major step for MCE and should involve the board of directors, executive staff, and specific outside advisors before we would actually go and actually issue debt. So, so why is this relevant? What's the relevance to MCE? Um, the importance of being prepared. So, when the opportunity does present itself from a dead start, um, it would take probably about up to 12 months to be ready to issue debt for the first time. Um, and, you know, MCE should avail, avail itself of this capability because if we're going to um, reach our goal of 85% renewable energy and 99% GHG free by 2029, we're going to have to utilize all of the tools in our toolkit. And one of those is tax exempt debt. Um, it's a distinct advantage that we have um, over um, investor owned utilities and direct access providers who can't issue tax exempt debt 
for pure project ownership. So, you know, MCE has been, been going through a bit of a financial evolution, um, and we've taken a number of steps to get ready for this next really big step. Um, as was just mentioned again earlier today, we're, we, we're going to be meeting um, our reserve policy and liquidity goals. And, you know, a few months ago, we increased those uh, more stretched targets to get to the point of 60% um, net position of our, of our operating revenues. Um, we have set up an operating reserve fund, um, one where we could put revenues in in the current fiscal year to be utilized as revenues in a future fiscal year. Um, we've obtained a second credit rating from Fitch, uh, an investment grade rating, and just recently upgraded our credit facility to 40 million from, from a major US bank, um, JP Morgan Chase. And we're currently working on um, a, a program to reduce the cost of our renewable energy through a tax exempt repayment program that's in progress currently. So I'm not gonna go into a lot of uh, detail here um, um, on the finance aspect of this, but you know, this is a notion of the benefits of own, owning versus renting an asset. Um, again, it possibly could be more cost effective to a standard power purchase agreement. Um, and we would look very, very closely at that before we ever can consider actually owning a project or, or storage. Um, but there's potentially enhanced value through operational efficiencies and synergies with MCE's other objectives, including resiliency, GHG free resources and microgrids. So MC has an opportunity to be in a position to access the tax exempt markets at the right opportunity. And given the timeline I mentioned to issue bonds, probably 10 to 12 months, we're proposing that we prepare in advance. In other words, if and when we get the opportunity, we would need only eight to 10 weeks to issue bonds um, and then could really you know, act quickly on an opportunity. So a quick look at the timeline um, and sort of color coded this in a way that suggests, hey, if we can just get these first five or six steps done, um, we don't commit to issue debt. We just um, do all the preliminary work and get ready. Um, we could then be a matter of weeks away from actually getting into the bond market to, to do a borrowing if, if we wanted to do that. So I'm gonna go through um, some of these initial steps, talk about them a little bit. Um, and you know, really with the notion of, of the importance that we see of, of having the board very much involved um, in these steps to get ready to issue debt. The first would be to adopt a debt policy. Um, uh, there's a now a law in California, SB 1029, that requires that any entity that, that would issue debt uh, has to uh, develop and adopt a debt policy. And debt policy would outline the situations and steps for issuing debt, the types of debt you could issue, fixed rate, variable rate, um, and how the debt fits into MCE's integrated resource plan, capital improvement program, or other strategic policy goals. The next step would be to select a municipal financial advisor. This, this too is required under um, MSRB regulations. And so a municipal financial advisor, a, an MA or an FA, um, needs to be employed by a municipal advisory firm, is licensed to advise municipal entities, and they would assist us with the initial steps in negotiations um, and some of the documentation. And then very specifically would help us in an actual pricing of a bond issue um, with an underwriting team if we ever got to that point. And we would select um, a financial advisor through, certainly through um, an RFO or an RFP process. The next big important step would be to select a bond council firm. Um, and we would want to select a nationally recognized law firm specializing specifically in municipal utility finance law. Um, one nationally recognized, but experienced here in California. Um, and this bond council firm would assist with drafting documents, the bond resolution or indenture, depending upon the type of document we would issue bonds under, um, help us with covenants and the associated financial metrics. And importantly, they need to be nationally recognized because they would provide the critical tax opinion that the interest on the bonds is exempt from federal income taxes and state of California income taxes as well. And I say nationally recognized because we would want outreach around the country for MCE's bond issue. Um, anticipate that likely we would be the first CCA to issue debt. Um, we would issue what are designated as green bonds. 
um, and we would want to um, appeal to uh, you know a nationwide audience for these securities. Um, and continued again, we would we would want to select one of the one of the larger, more um, recognized firms, um, or a Carrington, Stradlin Yoka, Hawking Sellafield. Again, there's a number of great firms, and we again would select select a firm. Uh, through some sort of an RFP process or RFO process. It's very likely we would do that through our, um, our, our regular um, RFP process that we would do for, for legal counsel. The next big and important step would be we, we would uh, draft and adopt a bond indenture. The bond indenture is the document that dictates the requirements and conditions precedent before we actually issue debt, how the flow of funds um, are tracked, uh, the financial metrics and other operational requirements are bond covenants. Um, these include such things as um, the rate covenant, uh, additional bonds test, and so on. And the bond indenture would be created with input from staff, the board, and our municipal financial advisor. And then finally, uh, we could go through the process and actually select um, a team of bond underwriters. You know, they would be banks or investment banks that would actually underwrite and sell the bonds. Um, these underwriters would help us, again, with, with determining the bond covenants and other aspects of the financing, again, the most appropriate debt, debt product that would bring us the lowest borrowing costs and so on. Now, the underwriters would get hired by MCE, um, but they would not be paid and, you know, if and when they, the bonds are issued. And again, we would select this bond underwriting team through an RFP process. So it's a very, very competitive market, um, and um, we would... Um, ask them for pricing, um, not on the bonds, but on, on their own fees and so on, and what they would provide in terms of services. Um, and, you know, as an ex-underwriter, I mean, it's just, a, I know it's a very competitive market. So um, we would expect to see uh, some really good responses for an RFP. So once MCE completes those steps, the agency would be only about eight to 10 weeks away from actually accessing the bond market. Um, we estimate the total cost to get to that point um, would be about $125,000, which would be to pay bond council, certain early bond council fees and some fees to the FA. But as mentioned, um, you know, the underwriters um, only get paid if and when we actually enter the bond market. So oh, this is for discussion and recommendation today. Um, the implications for MC's future operations and approach to our business um, uh, is an important consideration and a lot of discussion an analysis will go into determining, you know, whether we actually want to own a project. Um, but we're looking to um, have to authorize staff to secure a financial advisor, uh, bond council, potentially underwriters to take the initial steps to get ready to access the taxes and capital markets. Um, and as Don mentioned early on, in terms of um, some of these ad hoc committees, um, we recommend that the MC board establish an ad hoc committee on bonding. Uh, to assist in developing a debt policy, to be engaged and report back to the full board as MC staff and advisors develop a bond indenture for the board to consider. Um, and we expect the ad hoc committee to, to need approximately two to three meetings over the next six to eight months uh, along that time schedule to, um, to advise staff and help with staff um, and then report back to the board on progress. Great, thank you, Garth. Uh, Ray, did you have a question or a comment? Um, uh, yeah, a question. Uh, Garth, thanks for that presentation. Uh, what's going, with all the volatility in the markets, can you help us understand what's happening in the municipal bond market at the moment? Is that similarly affected? You know, it's a, it, it's a complicated question in that interest rates have, have hit all time lows. I mean, the, the 10 year treasury was down around 50 basis points or a half a point. Uh, the 30 year treasury bond for a bit was below one percentage point. Um, so we've seen a, a tr tremendous reaction to the dislocations, um, primarily in the equity markets as cash has, has um, uh, left the equity markets and gone to, you know, flights to, to safety and quality, which are US treasury bonds. So. Um, the municipal market, you know, has seen interest rates go down quite a bit as well. Um, but, um, 
actually interest rates in the treasury markets have gone down so far that they've gone actually below where tax exempt rates are. But that said, I mean, it is, ex it is extremely attractive time to one, refinance your mortgage um, or two, uh, borrow in the tax exempt market. So um, for, for an entity like MCE, we would, we would be borrowing, you know, uh, probably under 2% for 20, 20 year money. So uh, very, very attractive time to actually enter the market if we were prepared to do so. Super. Other, qu other questions or comments? Yeah, this is Scott Perkins out in San Ramon. Um, does any of this work go, I want to use the word stale, but uh, is there a time at which you say, gee, it's been three years since we did X or we hired X through an RFP, that that work is likely to have to be repeated? When, when does this work become stale? That's a very good question. Um, so in terms of What's stale? I mean, um, what MC would not do um, were those last four or five steps, Director Perkins, and that would be to put together our disclosure information, which is our, our current uh, financial information, um, uh, information on our loads and, and um, resources and so on. So um, those are the kind of things that would be stale if we were to put that offering document together and had it sit for a number of months or even years. So, so no, um, very likely that, um, you know, certainly our bond council would remain in place. Our financial advisor would remain um, in, in place and vital. Um, the bond indenture uh, that we adopted, um, we could actually make changes to it if there'd been changes to the marketplace or, or protocols generally in the market um, because we had not issued debt under it, we could make changes to it. Um, so, um, really it's a lot of the, the very important and time consuming early work that we would get done. Uh, the type of disclosure documentation that would go stale, we wouldn't do until we were actually ready to issue bond. Okay, so from your timeline, uh, debt issu issuance timeline, the first seven steps pretty much don't go stale. And the last six steps are the ones that, uh, you, you wait until you're ready to strike and you've found a project or you've, you've got a reason to actually issue debt. That's correct, yes. Right, if you look at that first one, it says prepare the disclosure documentation, the preliminary official statement. Um, that absolutely is the document that really can't be more than you know, two to three weeks old um, before it starts to get stale. So again, you wouldn't prepare that document and that is a lot of work to prepare that document, but you wouldn't do that until you were actually ready to get into the marketplace. Thank you. Greg Lyman. Greg. Yeah, yeah, the Garth, the $125,000 investment is for those first seven steps that you have uh, on the screen as yellow. Yes, that's correct. And it would be um, for the, the cost of what we'd have to pay a financial advisor to get ready without actually issuing bonds and um, what we'd have to pay a bond council to assist in putting together the bond indenture and the legal work associated with that. And there would be additional cost to complete the additional six steps that are in orange or tan or whatever color that is? Yes, there would be. And the $40 million that's referenced in the staff report, what does that represent in, in like project costs, co-ownership? What would that represent in uh, megawatts? No, I'm sorry. So the $40 million reference in the staff report is a reference to the, um, the line of credit, the letter of credit that we have with J.P. Morgan Chase. So um, that was really just um, mentioning the steps that we have taken over the past year to be in a better financial position uh, to be able to access the credit market. So um, for example, you know, Moody's cites um, the fact that we've got a $40 million letter of credit because that helps with our liquidity for example. So that's what that, that $40 million was referenced to. It wasn't, wasn't referenced to any specific project or, um, or any notion that we were actually looking at a project. So, so what would be our future bonding capacity like, and how would it contribute to a potential project? Do we have a $100 million bonding capacity? Do we have $200 million bonding capacity? And how, much, how would that contribute to projects that we might participate in? Bonding capacity question is also a very good one. Um, and uh, it is really reflective of looking at an historical, look at our, our previ previous uh, margins. Um, 
what we're making net each year, year to year. Um, and then also a projection of what MCE would do in terms of its net margins each year. So, um, you know, at, we would be issuing what's, what are called revenue bonds and revenue bonds are secured by our net revenue. So after we, we um, pay for all the energy, um, we see what our net revenues are and those net revenues are what are pledged to pay the debt service annually on the bond. So, um, you know, those net revenue numbers have gone up dramatically over the last few years here at MCE. Um, you'll note that for a projection for next year, those, the, the projected revenues are a little bit, you know, they're lower. Yep, 40 um, million. All right, and, as and opposed to the 50 or 60, so. Um, I, I, I build on my earlier question of our target and the fact that uh, if we do bond against our revenue, we will may take longer to get to our target. So what, in, to be prudent, and I understand that there's an ad hoc committee that would potentially develop our policy, to be prudent, what what is the type of project or what is the type of cash that we would be able to potentially participate in a project given prudent, typical prudent uh, investment strategies or our bonding path strategies? Well, we could, we could use a combination of our existing um, uh, net position. In other words, uh, apply some equity and borrow the rest. Um, we certainly don't have any, any project in mind, um, but you think of it this way as well. Um, if we are, if we made a decision to own a project, um, we would go through the analysis to, to prove to ourselves that owning that project is cheaper than, than paying for it through a PPA. So presumably, you know, that's going to reduce, reduce our, um, quote unquote, energy costs through the project ownership, which will bring more to the bottom line, you know, which would then help our coverage numbers. So you can think of it that way, that it's not just a net additional amount of debt, it's going to be reducing our operating costs reflective of reducing what we other, otherwise would have been paying through a PPA. Agreed. So in, in round terms, if we were to say it, we wanted to take $10 million of our cash flow, our net uh, contribution to uh, reserves and take that $10 million of, of annual cash and turn it into a bond, it would represent 300 million, roughly? Not quite that much. Um, um, at these interest rates, probably closer to um, 150 million, something like that. And, and, and that would be a significant project. Um, yeah, I leave that to our power resource people, but, um, the canals, but yeah, that's, that would be a pretty significant project for MCE. Great. Um, and, and well, for, just uh, this weekend, it would be, for example, uh, maybe a hundred megawatt battery somewhere distant from the Bay Area. Excellent. Thank you, Vikan, for that suggestion. I'm, sure. I'm done with my questions. I, I actually am supporting this tremendously because I think for $125,000, we get nine tenths of the way there. And with our current uh, net positive cash flow as, as, I, as covered by our budget and covered in this discussion, we are in very good position to participate in projects that would reduce our overall cost as a result of being a co-owner or part owner in, in some of these projects. And as demonstrated by my line of questioning, we have significant purchasing power as a result of our cash flow. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Greg. Any other questions or comments by board members? Yeah, this is Ray with you again, um, if I may. Um, this is, uh, I'm, as I said in technical committee, I'm very, very supportive of this. This is going to ramp us up to the, another scale, and uh, and for all the reasons that Greg, uh, Director Levin, has uh, indicated, I'm extremely supportive of this. Super, Kevin. Did you have something you wanted to say? Well, I did, except Ray just stole my thunder. So, um, <laughs> uh, you know, as I as I said I, when we when we discussed this in in committee, this is uh, as it was at that time, and it is still tonight. I think the most exciting thing we had on our agenda. Really? And I really am excited about the opportunity to do that. And as I also mentioned uh, in reflecting on our, our budget and the presentation there, this is yet another example of the, the fact that we're even having this conversation 
is a reflection of the maturity of the organization. Uh, and I think it's very exciting that we can uh, proceed with that. And just on, you know, on Greg's point, it, 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 we don't know what kind of projects are going to walk our way when the opportunity presents itself. But we need to be able to be in a position uh, to take advantage of those opportunities when they arise. And this is a this is a really important step to allow us to do that. So, uh, if 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 I may, I'd like to make a motion unless others have something to uh, contribute. No, that's great, Kevin. I'm just going to ask Dawn if you wanted to have further discussion about the ad hoc bonding committee before we took action. Yes. Right. Yeah, maybe we could take this up as two separate motions, um, starting with the, the first one, which is authorizing staff to um, follow the steps outlined in recommendation one, and then we could take up the second one um, after that. We can do just one roll call vote, though. Um, <laughs> as long as we can only do one roll call vote, that would be great. Yeah. If there's no public comment, I'll oh. second the motion. Thank Greg you. Lyman. Thank you, Greg. All right. so. We have a motion and a second on the first item. Dawn, now, do you want to, I can't yeah. go forward without a roll call. So do you want to have your conversation yeah. about the ad hoc committee now? Let's do that. So um, the um, ad hoc bonding committee that um, we have in your packet has some interested folks listed. So Director Soss, Director Green, Director Haroff, and Director McCaskill have all expressed interest in being on the ad hoc bonding committee. Um, and I'm wondering if there are other directors that would like to be on that committee. So this is Ray again. I'd be happy to serve on this, um, but if obviously if there's room, but if there's others who wish to, then I will stand at the bottom of the list. Okay. Okay. There's plenty of. Room. I would prefer I, I would prefer that Ray stand at the top of the list. So. <laughs> uh, Greg Lyman, I would be interested in serving at the bottom of the list and easily bounced if there's anybody else with interest. Okay, anyone else? All right, I think, okay. that's, our, I think that's our list. So uh, Kevin, would you like to amend your motion now to add the establishment of an ad hoc committee on bonding? Yes, I'd be happy to uh, to amend the motion to address both items, uh, recommendations one and two, to uh, to include the approval of the proposed list of uh, participants in the ad hoc committee on bonding. Okay, and Ray, uh, you raised your hand because you want a second. All right, well, as the seconder, this is Greg Lyman. I'll approve. Ray, did you have a comment? You're on mute, Ray. You're on mute, but your hand is raised, so. Oop. Close enough. <laughs> All right, we have a motion and a second. Any further board comment? Oh, uh, Director Patterson. You know, I had my hand up because I was gonna make a motion, but it's all done, so I'm just gonna wait to vote. Okie dokie. All right, anyone, any other comment? I'll hazard a question of whether there's anyone from the public. I think I right. see Director Anderson has his hand up potentially. Ah. Director Anderson, were you trying to make a comment or maybe you were just adjusting your camera? I was simply adjusting my camera. Okay, great. And I think <laughs> we're ready to move on this item. It's very important. Okay. All right. Arlene, you want to do a roll call? Sorry about that. Belvedere. Yes. Benicia? Yes. Concord? Contra Costa County? Town of Corte Madera? Yes. Danville? Yes. El Cerrito? Yes. Fairfax? Yes. Lafayette? Yes. Larkspur? Yes. County of Marin? Yes. Martinez? Moraga? County of Napa and all five Napa cities? Yes. Nevado? Yes. Oakley? Yes. City of Pano? Yes. Pittsburgh? Yes. 
Richmond, Ross, San Anselmo, San Pablo, San Rafael, San Ramon. Yes, yes. Sausalito and Mill Valley. Yes. County of Solano, Tiburon, Walnut Creek. Yes. Great. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Darlene. Any final board matters and staff matters other than to wish Sloan smooth sailing in the, for in the future? We're going to miss your years of contribution to MC. Yes. Thank you so much. We'll miss you, Sloan. Yeah. Good luck and God bless. I'll move that we, that we uh, adjourn the meeting. And <laughs> we're going to do it without a motion because we don't want to do a roll call. But uh, thank you, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> we're only we're only we're only letting Sloan go if he promises that I get his cookies. Uh -huh. There you when, go. When when we when we readjourn in person. <laughs> Perfect. Thank, Thank you, Sloan. Be safe, everybody. Stay healthy, yeah. everybody. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Good night. Good night. Good night.